this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of you know five hundred thousand dollars to in debt. One hundred ninety-two million dollars. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host John Warlow. So when's the last time you read a book on selling your company? My guess is you've never read a book on selling your company. Why bother when the only books out there read like textbooks filled with acronyms and terms you've never heard of written by people who make it their job to make themselves look and sound smarter than you? Why bother? Well, the art of selling your business tries to do exactly the opposite. It features the stories of the founders I've listened to for the podcast. I've taken their best practices, their secret hacks, and bundled them into a storytelling format so that you can take away the key lessons, the action plan, the the field guide without sifting through the boring textbook that is most books on the topic of selling your company. You can get it at builttosell.com slash selling. So one of the things you're gonna have to think through when you go to eventually exit your business is your non-compete. This is a document that you sign where you agree not to compete with your acquirer for a period of time after they buy your company. It's one of those documents that when you're signing it, you may be like, I don't care how long my non-compete is, you can have it for ever. I'm never coming back into this industry or this business again. You may be so relieved to be leaving your business that you may give away too much in your non-compete. Never is a long time. And as my next guest will point out, there may be a point in time in the future that getting back into the same industry you're selling out of makes sense and is appealing. And it's at that point, you will want to have governors on your non-compete agreement. Here to tell you how he got to own his business twice is Nick Layton. Nick Layton, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Hey, nice to meet you. How are you doing, John? I'm great. So tell me about net results. Mm. I think people are familiar with an advertising agency model, but how were you guys different than the traditional agency? Uh, Well, we started it in 1999. I was in the Middle East. um, So the agency was based in Dubai. Advertising, marketing, public relations. Um, And I used to work for a technology company, a listed technology company in the Middle East. I'd worked around the world for them. Ended up in the Middle East. And my problem was that I couldn't find agencies or staff that understood technology, understood marketing at a Western level, but also understood the Middle East market. So the opportunity kind of arose that I should start the agency. And I was very fortunate back in 1999, there weren't very many uh, sophisticated agencies or anything else going on in the Middle East. So I spoke to maybe four, five, six other of my friends who are marketing managers and technology clients um, and said, if I start this, will you come? And they said, yes because they had the same problems I did. So I was very fortunate. I started the agency within the first month. I had five well-respected brand name tech companies we were doing work for. Um, So we grew very quickly um, in that first year. And within that first year, Dubai at that time wasn't known, but Dubai announced Dubai Internet City, which then attracted all these other tech companies from around the world. So I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time in the right industry. And we grew that agency um, for a number of years based on that strength of technology and doing marketing for those kind of companies. How, how big did you get it before you decided you wanted to sell mm. you know, either revenue or number of employees, whatever you're comfortable sharing? Right. So um, the, well, the, there's a number of things here. So size-wise and office-wise, so we were based in Dubai, which is where the technology companies were, and it's actually where the media hub for the region is. So that made sense. We then started having clients in Abu Dhabi, which is, you know, 90 minutes down the road in the same country. That's great. Um, We then had clients who really wanted to hit Saudi Arabia. Um, And that's a big challenge culturally, um, legally. um, But Saudi Arabia is where the money is for that region. Um, So then we had an office in Saudi Arabia as well. So we had three offices, um, we'd have about 12 full-time employees um, at any given time. And then we would have freelancers um, that we could use in every single country across the Middle East. 
Uh, and I say that in a broad way because what some people think of the Middle East is not what other people would think. So some people would come and say, yes, we need work done in, in Iran or Iraq. And that's what was in the Middle East. Some people think Turkey is or isn't. Some people go as far as Morocco. So we had a lot of freelancers depending on our client and their reach would depend on what teams we put together. Um, it's, such, so, it's so interesting because, you know, I've, I've never been to the Middle East. And to me, it's this sort of exotic place where I totally, I have these probably like, like stereotypes of what it would be like, but I've never actually been. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I probably would be, it would, be, it would me to actually go. Uh, but I probably have all the same stereotypes that, that you it's, and others may have had it, before you got there. It, it's rapidly changing, um, you know, and if I think about um, some of the large events that happen at a global scale, people would then um, project their opinions about that on what the work we were doing in the Middle East. And in fact, at, right at the beginning when we started, we produced videos which said your perception of the Middle East is this, and it would be war and destruction and poverty, but really it's this, and we show luxury hotels and businesses thriving and people enjoying themselves. Um, you know, and when, you know, the, when in New York, the trade centers, um, fell, um, there was a, what's called the trade center in Dubai, which was, I don't know, a block away from my office. So people were calling me up going, what's going on? And are there tanks going down the street? And of course there were, you know, business continued. Um, so yeah, it was some interesting times, but because there was so much opportunity in the region, the large, um, clients that we represented came. Um, so we were very fortunate um, and we grew and we, um, we had revenues around the 2 million mark for an agency, which you know, is, is highly desirable. We were very lucky we could hire, we could charge ourselves at a great rate. We, we were lucky enough to be able to do that. And that was two, uh, two areas to that. Um, from an agency perspective, if you can specialize, you can obviously charge more money. So we specialize in technology. So, so that was- A know, couple hundred grand in revenue per full-time employee almost. So that right. feels pretty- exactly pretty uh, profitable relative to i'm used to seeing kind of 100 150 grand so that would be and, the higher end of and then of course we had this whole structure around us that we didn't have any tax to pay because um dubai and Niger emirates is a tax-free area so you know this was, <laughs> this was massive uh, so the way we structured our businesses and, and how we could pay people was all very different but you know we had additional expenses that other people wouldn't have we'd often have to bring people into the region um for our team because they didn't exist locally. The talent pool was quite shallow. Um, and that has its own challenges and people would you know, come in and last three months and they're just not like the region and leave. Yeah. So you Nick, know, what, what, what did you want to sell? What, was there like a trigger that there started was. the process for you? There was. And um, the Middle East at the time was fantastic, but it's a very itchy place. Um, I think I don't, in the whole, all the years I lived there, I don't think I stayed more than three months actually there without traveling. Um, and I was a member of um, EO um, at the time in Dubai, um, which had great members. It was fantastic. And there was an international um, conference, a university in Los Angeles. It's Los Angeles, just somewhere I've been to and I've lived previously. And I actually went to one of the events for the university, which was at Hugh Hefner's Playboy Mansion. And I bumped into a girl who looked like a bunny and told me her name was July 98. Um, and I fell in love. And I ended up marrying that girl, um, but That's she was based awesome. in California. Um, <laughs> was so, she really July 98? Well, I realized later she wasn't quite, um, <laughs> but you know, there were already five or six bunnies there wearing black cocktail dresses. And the best thing is she wasn't an EO member. She'd actually gay crashed the party. So wow. you know, if you're going to gay crash the Playboy Mansion, I guess you just wear a black cocktail dress. Um, so, you know, so when I see people moving from country to country, I normally ask them the question, are you running to or running from? In my case, I was running to. Um, so we decided that California was going to be our base, not to buy. Um, I was lucky by that stage, I actually had a managing director already in place. Um, so I spent the next couple of years um, really grooming the agency that it was not dependent on me, which is hard to do for a marketing agency. Um, often it becomes owner dependent. Um, so I, I had enough time to do that. I knew that I had to move out of the region sooner or later. Uh, but then we, when we um, became pregnant with our daughter, um, my wife pretty much said, okay, it's time for you to, to not be there and not travel there. And, you know, when I first met my wife, I would come to Southern California for a week every six weeks. And then gradually that reversed to I'd be back in Dubai a week out of every six weeks. So Nick, I, I think a lot of people listening to this 
uh, are going to be asking themselves, what tactically, very specifically, did you do during that time to enable your agency to work, to run without you? I heard mm. hire a managing director, mm -hmm. so that's great. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any, like maybe one or two other very tactical things that you did to enable it to run without you there? Yeah, absolutely. So the, um, I mean, you hear this from all kinds of, if you go to EO events or other um, entrepreneurial or leadership events, you hear a lot about making sure you know why you're in business and, and the planning. Um, and all the business owners that I meet, they know they need a plan, but not very many of them really have a plan. We became very regimented in every year, sitting down with the team, spending two days out of the office and building that plan and getting the buy-in from the whole team. That was really important for getting the momentum going at the beginning of every year. Um, and we would um, start with, you know, okay, well, our revenue goals, et cetera, why are we in business? But we would drill down to the client level and decide if, you know, how long do you think we could keep them, where we thought the opportunities for them were. Um, so we had a very defined plan, which then led to monthly goals, which then eventually led to key performance indicators for everyone within the organization. And, and did you follow absolutely. any any one system? Like I, I'm, I'm aware of a number of different platforms mm -hmm. that, that sort of have some methodology. Did you follow one of the methodologies? Um, at the time, that was really a hybrid. Um, so, you know, you know, Vern Harnish, you know, he has a great you know, um, program behind him and so do other people. And we kind of melded several together um, that made it work for us. Um, and that's so, legitimate. So yeah. one of the tactical things you did was some really comprehensive planning. Mm -hmm. uh, you hired a managing director. Is the third thing that you could point to that enabled your agency to work without you? Um, the f I, you have to let go. And that's one of the hardest things if you build a company yourself um, is to say, you know what? Someone else can also sign checks. Um, yes, I don't need to be on every call. And yes, the team can get themselves out of problems. Um, so I actually learned from um, hearing other people speak when, when you make yourself hard to um, people to get contact with you, people put up barriers around you, people actually deal with that things themselves and they solve it themselves. And for me, it happened almost accidentally. The time difference between Los Angeles and Dubai is normally 12 hours or 11 hours, depending on the time, time of year. Um, so automatically there's a barrier to entry. There was uh, the, the barrier for communication was at the beginning or the end of the day. During the day, my team had to figure it out. And that I think was uh, really powerful. That's a, a, kind of a forcing function in and of itself is the 12 mm -hmm. hour time difference mm -hmm. of that. So your wife comes to you and says, honey, we're pregnant. Time to cut the uh, cord. We're not, mm -hmm. uh, we're not commuting back to Dubai every day. What did mm -hmm. you do next to to market this business for sale? Uh, so at that stage, um, I, I put in a new general manager, um, someone who had a lot of experience um, and very large agency, global scale. And he knew that the remit was that when the time was right, I wanted to be out of the agency. And so that's an opportunity for him. And it was an opportunity for him to leverage his relationships to see who might be that, that good purchaser. In what way did he benefit from the sale? Um, he was going to get um, a percentage ownership um, of that and was going to be the guy running the agency. That that was the intent um, to do that. So we wanted to find a um, purchaser very specifically that was not already in the region, someone who wants to come into the Middle East region and probably needed um, that base of, of a good leader already established. How, how did you structure? Because I know that's another question a lot of our listeners grapple with is structuring the compensation for their kind of general manager to IC president role. So there seems mm -hmm. to be a few different ways to slice it. One is, you know, you pay them a salary and some sort of a success fee. If you sell the company, another is to, is to give them equity, like as a gift, others sell equity, others give options. Mm -hmm. I think of other things, right. some phantom shares. Like how did mm -hmm. you how did you structure it with your job? Well, so, you know, the first structure wasn't the best structure. We actually, um, uh, through, before this process, um, I heard, I experienced that everyone who is an owner in, in a company or an agency gives more. So I had this grand idea of um, offering ownership to everyone um, in the agency. Um, so I want to change everyone's business card to, you know, I'm an owner and account manager, owner and, you know, translator, whatever everyone's role was. Um, put together this great elaborate plan, launched it to everyone, 
and, and it was crickets. They're like, what are you doing? And they essentially, I guess, didn't believe that we were going to give them that ownership um, because unfortunately in the Middle East, there wasn't really a legal structure to do that. Um, it wasn't as if we could go through an ESOP or anything. Um, so I was a sole owner, although legally in the Middle East, it's slightly different because you have to have an Arabic sponsor. Um, so ultimately for this general manager, as I brought them on, um, my fear was that we would stop selling, we'd stop concentrating on growing the agency as we were selling the agency. So I gave them a salary um, and a package of benefits around that. And I gave them a bonus on new business coming in. And I offered them an ownership um, with the new purchaser. So in other words, if I was selling 100% um, of the ownership of the company, um, they would get part and the new owner would get another part, if that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think it does. I'm not sure how you would structure that. How, how did you structure that piece? So again, being in the Middle East, legalities are slightly different. So it was really um, written on a piece of paper and a handshake. Um, okay. And that's that's the best we could really do. So there's a lot of trust involved. Um, but I find with this, it just doesn't matter how long that contract is. As long as there's a common understanding between two people and there's trust built, it's going to work out. Take me back to your presentation. So you're like, we're going to make you owner plus a, owner and account manager, owner and a creative director, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you said it was crickets. Did like what was what were they reacting to? Did you stipulate how many shares they were getting and yep. what they were worth or oh my goodness there's a whole structure behind it i mean maybe it's too complicated but yeah well, we made a whole based on longevity and seniority level and you know what you do moving forward and the key performance indicators um and this is what it's going to equal out to and you know if we sell the agency at a certain time for this amount of money this is how much money you'd make uh, and yeah I, they, they're just like look we're here because we, we like the agency. We like doing the work. We want to live here. Um, so yeah, don't care about that. Yeah. Really? Wow, that's yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, tech company people listening to that are going to be blown oh. away. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, You're I worked in a tech company. company. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I got all the shares and, it, you know, that, it was a huge amount of money. It was one of the major, major things. So yeah, yeah, they just didn't care. And in retrospect, I mean, you had, you've had time to reflect on this. Mm -hmm. What might you do differently if you were in in the situation of wanting to empower your employees, make them feel like owners, want you know engage, try to get them to act like owners? Mm -hmm. What might you do differently if you had a kind of do over a mulligan? Well, I think now you you know you could buy all kinds of tests or you know assessments that you can use with a team to really find out what does motivate them. And I think as business owners, entrepreneurs, we're very misguided and think that everyone else is motivated the same way as we are. Um, so anyone who's listening to this, they're entrepreneurial and they're building businesses. So yes, of course they're motivated by money, but some people just aren't. Um, and there are other motivators that they have. So I think I'd spend more time right now understanding for my team, what motivates them? Is it just recognition? Is it aesthetics around them? Is it the intellectual challenge? There are so many things that could really be motivating someone beyond money. And I don't think I was aware of that at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did you come to learn later was more important to them than ownership? Um, in the agency of the type that we had, it was a diverse thing. So that's why it's so complicated, I think even more today, um, when we have dispersed teams to motivate everyone. You've almost, as a leader or as a manager, you've got to know what motivates each individual person. Um, so you, one, um, style of motivation is not going to work. What so did you, you come to learn though, specifically for your folks of okay. which there were 12? What did you, what were the themes you heard about what does get them? So the, um, freedom was a big thing, um, which is kind of interesting because you're in a Muslim society in the Middle East where you don't have a lot of freedoms. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have less freedoms in, in that kind of a society than elsewhere. So, Recognition was important, but freedoms within the business world was kind of important. So hmm. back then it was like, oh, you know, one day a week I, I could work from home, which was kind of unheard of because of the agency culture, everyone's in the, you know, we have beanbags in the office and it's bright colored walls and, you know, we have a food table and a football table. Sure. It's like, yeah, that was all important. But actually some people were like, you know, I just like to work at home for one day a week. 
sounds a bit crazy now. Um, so that was important to people. Um, being able to set their own times um, within the day. Some people were morning, some people weren't. Some people had um, cultural, religious implications that, you know, maybe they were fasting or they weren't at certain times of the year. So for them to all have their own freedom of setting their times and just having a system that we knew when we could get in contact with people, but they pretty much could come and go as they wanted. Um, and then one of the most vital things that motivated my team was the clients we took. So mm -hmm. our customer base. And although, as I said earlier, we were tech focused, we took one client that wasn't a tech client, and that was charity work we did for the United Nations for the World Food Program. And that alone motivated and also helped us with recruitment more than anything else we could do. Really interesting. What was the name of the program? It was the United Nations, and you mentioned the World Food Program, which is one of the largest charity organizations in the world, but it allowed people a little bit more meaning in their life. So as well as helping a company that's listed on a stock exchange and have more profit, they also knew that they were doing something in the marketing world, which fed more kids. Um, and it didn't, you know, it was pretty good that we'd go out and do work in the field as well. And, you know, we went into Pakistan and Cambodia and showed journalists all the aid work the United Nations were doing. And my team loved that. Let's go back to the Playboy Mansion. Mm -hmm. Sure. You, oh, you, you mean to go? I thought you meant let's just go. Okay, no, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> I mean, let's go back to the sale of the company. So right. you put these things in place. Yeah. You are getting the company to run without you through the techniques we talked about. What was next? Did your GM find potential suitors? Did you like? Did you put the business on the market? Did you hire an MA professional? Like, how did you proactively get this done? I worked with, we, we, did, we did everything. Um, so I spoke to an M&A guy um, and worked with them. Uh, they were based out of the UK. They had options, but nothing which was exciting. Um, I think they felt that I wanted to sell, therefore what's available right now. Um, and it really was through personal connections. And as anyone who's gone through um, the sale of a company, it's not because you want to sell this month or next month or next year. That's not going to make it. If you want a good sale, it's got to be a strategic buy for who I was going to take the company. And for us, it was very strategic. The agency who eventually um, we sold to um, was in the right place and valued what we had. So at the time, they valued the team that we had in place, the client base we had, and actually the office space we had was really hard to come by. Um, so there's a real shortage um, at the time. So they wanted that. Just, uh, times have changed. Ever since right, then. exactly, right? So it was the team, the client base, and that office space. Um, that they wanted. Um, and that was interesting to me because as one of the first agencies in the Middle East um, with this kind of Western feel, we thought it was our reputation that someone actually wants to come and buy. And our reputation meant nothing to this agency. This agency was obviously larger, well, not obviously, but was larger than us. And that already had an international reach. They just didn't have a reach in the Middle East. And that's what they were looking for. Got it. That's helpful for sure. I want to go back to what you shared about the UK-based firm that was looking for offers. You mentioned they came up with a few, but nothing was interesting. What did you think the company might be worth? Like, did you have a multiple of earnings or revenue or some number in your mind that, that you thought right. was a fair number? Um, fair, yes. Um, there wasn't a huge expectation. Um, so, you know, once you're working between, you know, one and $3 million in, in revenue, you know, for what I want to do at the stage of my life, um, if I'd made, you know, one time earnings or three times earnings wasn't really going to change my life. Um, so that wasn't so important. I was moving on to something else, not retiring forever. And this has got to keep me going until I die. Um, so there weren't very many transactions. There wasn't very much history to look at. So it was very much a, well, what could this be worth to someone else? Um, and the Middle East um, was moving very quickly at the time. So that was pretty hard. Um, so we had to really sit down and go, wow, I don't know if it's a multiple. I don't know if it's 0 0.5, 1, 2, 3. We really didn't have any idea. It's like, let's see what people will offer us. And that M&A expert came with, looks at it as a transaction, as a simple transaction for himself. And so I don't think was able to um, show the real value of the agency. And what, what sort of multiples did they get? You mentioned the offers were not really terribly interesting. Yeah. Like what, what sort of stuff were you getting from them? Yeah, less, less than a multiple of one. 
um, on a, when you, you say know, less than one times revenue or revenue, one, right? Less yeah. than one times revenue. Got it. Right. Okay. And, um, and so you thought it's got to be worth more than that. Yeah. I, I mean, that was the gut and I wasn't in a huge rush. I mean, it wasn't like I had a deadline I had to do this by, I mean, apart from negotiating with your wife, which is always, you know, the most important thing to be doing, but I was going to say, it's right. like, yeah, a, bit of a, a bit of a deadline, <laughs> you know, but you know, I didn't have to be here the day that I thought it was born, but it's like, you know, it's, um, you yeah. know, so it was trying to find the right and having the patience and remembering to stay focused on the actual business while that's going on. I see too many businesses who folk, the owner, because they're one person, um, will focus on all that energy you need for that sale. And they forget to look at the day to day running of their business. Um, so that was a yeah. focus for us as well. For sure. So you get the offers from the UK companies, mm. not terribly interesting. Right. What next? Where did you go from there? Uh, we, were, we were lucky that the GM I put in was very well connected um, in the agency space and managed to, and I have no idea how, connect an agency, someone with finances in Saudi Arabia, and to connect those two entities and our agency together to put something together happened, I guess, relatively quickly. Um, so, you know, again, in the Middle East, there's no formal accounting even. So it's as simple as going, well, his access to our bank account statements, um, and everything you need to know is there. there there's no formal, you know, statements or, or you know, profit and loss. I can even give you, just take everything you want from our bank account. Literally um, a bank account statement? Literally bank statement. That's yeah. crazy. Um, and, Think and about we, that. It's nuts. Yeah, right. So, I mean, we've, we've been banking with the same bank forever and it's all online. Um, I mean, well, maybe I say forever. When I first started the agency, again, due to rules and regulations, we worked off an envelope. On the front of the envelope, we wrote all the money that we owed people. On the back of the envelope, all the money that people owed us. And if we have money in the envelope, we were cash positive. Life was good. So, yeah. There, wow. Because there's, no, there's no tax, there's no formal accounting. Um, so, oh know. my gosh, I had, I was, I, I wasn't making the connection between not paying tax right. and no formal accounting. So right. you literally have a bank statement and the acquirers can look at money yeah. in. So this yeah. is all the money coming in this month mm -hmm. and this is all the money going out. Yep. And you see that the same, same, you know, legitimate listed companies are paying us oh every gosh, month. So therefore you can see how much money we make it. You know, it's kind of obvious. You can see our salary line Then we go done. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Okay, so you did that. And so this general manager found an agency, it sounds mm -hmm. like, that wanted yep. to have a presence in Dubai. Mm -hmm. um, are we able to talk about the name of that agency or do you prefer to? I can't, to I can't tell you that. Okay, um, no worries. I, and you're going to find out why, why I can't do that. But, um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So we started talking um, and it was clearly one just managed the region. Yeah. Got it. And so they came forward with an offer. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction to that? Yeah, it was, I'm like, Sure. You know, again, it wasn't really, I had to hit a value because it, there wasn't very much valuation available. It was as much a guess as anything else. So I'm like, it sounds fair. Sounds good. Um, and again, it was pretty informal. I mean, documents went backwards and forwards, but they, you know, they, they wanted our people, our accounts and our space. Um, and you know, they, they didn't care about our reputation or anything else. And so I asked them kind of just informally, so what are you going to do from day one? I'm interested to know, are you going to like jewel brand for a little bit and then switch it over? And, and they said, no, our, our brand is, it holds it on its own. So we're going to come into the region and the day that we, that we purchase you, we are going to rebrand your agency. And I'm like, that's awesome. And I'm like, so you don't really want to buy the net results brand. Um, they said, no, that, that it doesn't mean anything to us. And I'm like, well, that's awesome. Let's take that off the table. Let's just give you what you want. Um, and that was kind of my 11th hour negotiation. Um, and so they didn't buy my brand. They, they bought the people, the accounts uh, and the space. And with regards to the original offer that they made mm -hmm. going back and forth, I'm assuming that was more than the kind of one times revenue that the folks in the UK were offering. Are you able to yeah. share sort of? So yeah, it was more than one times revenue. It wasn't as much as two times revenue, um, okay. but I felt confident that these people were beyond the money I was selling it for. We're going to look off the clients, going to look off the team. Um, and to me, that was important. Okay. So they, they come to an offer of somewhere between one and two times revenue. 
you're like, okay, yeah, I think we can get a deal done. Last minute, they're like, we're, we're going to drop the net results brand. Um, did you lower the, did they lower the price based on getting rid of the brand or no. did you ask like, no, just the no. same number? Yeah, same number. That was fine. They, um, it, it, it didn't have a value for them. I think that so they literally put yeah. no value on the brand. Yeah. Got it. And, and why was it important to you to hold on to that? Did you, did at the time, did you, did you want to hold on to it? If so, why? So there was no master plan. All I could tell you was its convenience. So while I was selling this agency in the Middle East, I'd already started doing some work in the US. Um, you know, there wasn't there wasn't a team or structure around it, but I was doing it under the same um, company name. So I, I literally said to the acquirer, I'm like, well, I'm still using you know the website net results for work I'm doing in the US. So it's just more convenient for me if I keep that website. I'll take down anything about the Middle East. And they're like, yeah, that's cool, whatever. Um, now, I didn't realize there's going to be a huge upsell to that eventually. Um, the upside for keeping the brand was massive, but I only just did it for a convenient sake of same website. Some people still know me by that name. You know, seems convenient. Got it. So in the back of your mind, you thought, these guys are crazy. You know, I don't think I saw they were crazy. I Because I, I knew their brand. I'd known their brand for some time. Um, I, I don't think they'd done their, not their due diligence. In fact, I don't think my general manager had, had done the due diligence enough to, to advise them um, that what was going on. I mean, he had the longer term relationship with them. Um, I was leaving the region and you know, being told there's no compete. I was told I could not work in the Middle East for a certain amount of time. And for them, that was really important. For me, I couldn't be happy. I was going to move to California and you know, be with my wife, and my new baby. Um, so that was an upside to me. Um, and they just thought the clients that we had would respect and move on over to a new brand and no questions would be asked. Got it. I wanted to ask you about non-competes. So mm -hmm. you had to sign a non-compete. Mm -hmm. well, what did that preclude you from doing? Pretty much precluded me for um, two years out of the region, um, which I was more than happy in this case to sign because I had no intention of being in the Middle East for the next two years. Um, How do you put barriers or wrappers or guardrails around that because being in the middle east you know is one thing you can't step foot on soil in the middle east versus work with a brand that's domiciled in the middle east or but you weren't doing that anyways you were working with these big technology companies that wanted a presence in the middle east so like yeah. how did you guys put guardrails to say yeah, it to, was to make that practical yeah i mean again it was down to language and a common understanding and a trust like, we, we just don't want to see you working in this Middle East region. Um, and, I, you know, it was such a, an easy um, agreement for me because I, I had no attention. They knew why I wanted to, to, um, to leave the region. Um, so they're like, you can do anything you want in the U.S. We don't care. We're not in the U.S. Um, that's not a market for us to go after. Um, so th they had an understanding. I think they probably could feel the the trust I mean, you know if you have a wife and a kid in one country you're probably going to go there um so i think there's trust there legally could they have um done very much better i don't think so mm, mm. so what happens next so you so i come i come to southern california um and i'm doing my thing in southern california and then one day i get this call from someone it says, um, hey, Nick, you, you're still doing work in the Middle East? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm someone in a tech company had moved a couple of times. I'm like, well, no, because I sold the agency. They're like, well, really? Um, you know, I'm like, yeah, this is the agency I sold too. And they're like, well, they, they, uh, they say they, they have no presence in the Middle East. Like, let's see anything on their website. I'm like, really? Did a little bit of digging. And probably about two years later, let's put it that way, um, they moved out of the region, which is understandable because I saw it at the end of 2006 and, you know, now we're looking at A, it's beginning to be nine, you know, there's some recession rumblings going on. Um, so that's pretty much what happened. That agency withdrew from the region. Um, so I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Um, and then obviously- the So wait, quite Nick, the, the agency that bought you- mm -hmm. Retreated from the Middle East. From the Middle East, right. So, so they, they basically wrote off the entire investment of your uh, company, presumably. Well, I mean, they've been there for over a year, so they probably got some money back. Um, but what I does that have to do with your life in California? Why is that relevant to the story? 
So that's relevant because after a recession, I had a couple more people who call me up and say, hey, Nick, net results. So I'm you know, still doing stuff in the Middle East. And I'm, I'm like, oh, there's a demand here. And although I said I wasn't going to be there, I was very happy not to be there. It really was as simple as turning on a website for me to have presence in the Middle East again. So um, I'm very fortunate that, that I have the opportunity to resell a company that I sold already because we turned on our website. I started putting sort of team members down there and often negotiating with my wife who said, you cannot go back there. We, we have a presence back in the Middle East. We have a team there, full-time team there, and we have clients there. Um, so I sold the agency. People who pushed it from me um, are now not longer there. I'm outside of my non compete. So the agency with the same branding was able to turn back on and we're up and running again. It's kind of fun. And running up again under the same value so, proposition, helping technology so companies. Just technology companies, 100% focus on technology clients uh, with you know offices out of Dubai, um, doing our stuff. Um, and it was... You see in large company in large countries that you have to specialize locally. And when we're talking about the Middle East, which is a number of countries, it makes far more sense to be able to specialize not with the local market, but with an industry um, level. So in our case, technology and for the international work coming in. So in fact, we, we represent zero clients locally. There are no Middle East countries that we work with. We only work with international companies who are kind of coming into the region and we help them with their marketing. Um, so that allows us to have um, healthy uh, profit ratios. It allows us to charge a sensible amount of money um, and it allows us to stay within a specialization. And do you continue to own the business now? And have ownership. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I won't, be offering, for... well, I won't be offering ownership for the rest of the team. So I don't think that's changed, but um, maybe they come and ask me. Maybe, maybe we'll talk about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I run that agency, um, but it's very, um, <laughs> how, how times have changed. I mean, you know, the fact that we're dispersed now is it means nothing to anyone, you know, before previously, well, Nick, you're not actually in Dubai this week. You know, where, where enough are you? Um, but yeah, our team are dispersed and that's totally great. Um, so there's way more of an understanding of people moving around that digital nomad kind of mentality can fly now, um, which is awesome. Um, so I do that. Uh, the team run it. Um, they're very good at what they do. And then and I also... Nick, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. And so as well as doing that, I now... Um, I, I wrote a book and, and I um, speak and I coach, but only in that um, marketing agency space. I love it. For folks who want to execute something similar, mm -hmm. and I'm not suggesting anyone listening to this do anything illegal, nor did you do anything illegal. This, mm -hmm. this was totally above the board. But there are ways to do this uh, illegally and get yourself right. in all kinds of hot water and all kinds of troubles. We want to avoid that at, at mm -hmm. all costs. So, mm -hmm. so let's just break it down for folks. Number one, you honored your non-compete. You have Absolutely. a two-year honor mm -hmm. compete. So you 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 honored that to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so it was two years. Did they push for a lengthier uh, non-compete? And did you limit it to two years? Do you remember? Or was it two years? When it I don't remember. Um, and... I don't remember negotiating particularly. Honestly, I, I would have given them longer because I didn't think I was ever going to be back that. So I don't think that was an issue. Got it. Okay. So there's a two-year non-compete. Mm -hmm. um, when they purchased your company, I'm assuming mm -hmm. they bought your assets as opposed to your shares. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Ye okay. Assets and in the Middle East, it's a business license that you have to be aware of. So there's, Got it. that was all part of that. Yeah. Talk to your lawyer. We're neither of us, right. to my knowledge, are lawyers. So mm -hmm. talk to your lawyer Absolutely. That. But, yep. but if you're buying the shares of a company, you're 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 inheriting all of its long-term liabilities and so forth. So that's not what they right. did. They absolutely. absolutely. There, was, there was no shares um, legal structure set up. So absolutely. Got it. And and the third thing you did wisely was you maintained ownership of your brand and your mm -hmm. website, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that they gave up freely. They they didn't want it. They didn't have any use for it. And you were able to carve that out. So that was another, that was kind of a third thing you did. Right. Now, that's not something that I dreamt up. Um, I know that other agencies have done exactly the same. In fact, I know Sochi and Sochi grew to one of the largest agencies by doing exactly the same um, style when they were a very small agency with only about a dozen people, they sold to a larger agency. And in the 11th hour, 
they said, you can buy us, but the new agency has to be called Saatchi and Saatchi. And that's a true story. So you go and, walk, go and find people from the beginning of Saatchi, Saatchi they'll tell you that story. Um, so I think brand, as far as what you're doing, if you're an owner, if you've built a company, keep hold of that brand. If you can. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not always possible, obviously. You, mm -hmm. you're, the, but just the unique situation that you had mm -hmm. enabled to do that. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Again, I'm, I, I want to reinforce, I'm not suggesting that anybody go away and, and not honor their non-compete or mm -hmm. do something that's underhanded, none of which you did. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, as long as you're honoring the terms of your agreement, then there are ways that you can sort of get back into the business that you were in before, perhaps even even better shape than you were before selling it. If, um, if you kind of play your cards right and, and you've got the right buyer that has right. you know, different motivations, as you said, it wasn't like mm -hmm. they wanted to become a global brand. They were really focused on the Middle East and that was right. an area. And, they, and, and I think part left. of what made this, e uh, this exchange easy, and, and I see a lot of people who don't go through a happy M&A experience, is because I think they approach this negotiation as people on opposite sides of the table. And we, we didn't, I think, all the parties involved had trust, um, ha even though we knew each other for a short amount of time. There was trust, there was openness, transparency. Um, so, you know, there wasn't any games being played. It wasn't, you know, I was, I was open. I'm like, I I'm moving out of the country for this region. And, you know, they, they, they told me why they wanted to come in into the region. Um, so that trust element and just working with the other party allowed us to very quickly negotiate um, and to find a win-win for everyone at that time. And it worked out. And, and, and here we are, here you are to tell the story. Tell us about the book. Where can people get it? What, what, what inspired sure. you behind? Yeah, yeah. The, the book is exactly where you want to be. It's a business owner's guide to passion, profit, and happiness. Um, so you can buy Amazon or Google Bookshops. Um, and, you know, Another time we'll talk about the stories, um, but that work that I did for the United Nations allowed me to be in crazy situations, um, like hijacked in Pakistan, and we went to crazy places in Cambodia. And that really allowed me to think as a business owner, where exactly do I want to be and what do I want to be doing with it? Because I believe it's more than just hitting the first and then the next million dollars. Well said indeed. And we'll put links to the book uh, and to net results in the show notes. Nick Layton, thanks for doing this. Awesome. This has been so much fun. Thanks indeed. Hey, if you like today's episode, you're going to love my new book, The Art of Selling Your Business. The book was inspired by the cohort of my guests over the years who have been able to negotiate an exit far better than the benchmark in their industry, sometimes two or three times more than I would have expected. I was curious to understand the tactics and strategies of these entrepreneurs and what they do differently from average performers. The result is a playbook for punching above your weight when it comes to selling your business. To learn more, go to builttosell.com slash selling, where we put together a collection of gifts for listeners who order the book. Just go to builttosell.com slash selling. Built to Sell Radio is produced by Haley Parkhill. Our audio and video engineer is Dennis Labataglia. If you like what you've just heard, subscribe to get a new episode delivered to your inbox each week. Just go to builttosell.com. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you, and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at facebook.com.